It's my pleasure to introduce Gail McKiernan. Um, Gail is a marine biologist by training, or more accurately, a biologi biological oceanographer, which I asked her to explain over dinner. Um, her particular expertise is the Chesapeake Bay. And throughout her professional life, she worked on this estuary. She was research director for, what's, am I, oh, am I not in? Yeah. Okay, she was research director for the University of Maryland Sea Grant College, um, overseeing studies from fisheries to biotech, all directed towards the ecology of the bay. She's been a birder since high school. And since about 40 years ago, she's been traveling with her husband, Barry, all to all seven continents to look for birds. So it's a great honor and pleasure to have Gail speaking tonight on birding Taiwan and a bit of China. I'm gonna switch hands. Okay, my talk tonight is on a trip I took in 2016 to Taiwan which was the bulk of the trip. And then there was a little bit of China at the end. Okay, so uh, Taiwan uh, from May 1st to May 13th, uh, Southeast China from May 13th to May 19th. This is a tour I took with Bird Tour Asia. It is not one of the ones we did independently. Our guide was James Eaton and the participants were uh, as listed. Uh, myself, uh, I went with a friend, Patty O'Neill from Massachusetts. And the other individuals were people I never, never had met before, except Les Hollowell, who I've been on a couple of trips with to uh, Philippines and to Borneo. The goals of the trip were sort of schizophrenic. Uh, the first part, which was Taiwan, was to essentially visit this island and see its 33 endemic birds, plus some other rarities and some potential splits, because there's a lot of sub uh, species that are endemic to Taiwan. And the way they're splitting things, they're probably all going to end up as separate species. And the one to China uh, was for specific rarities that are found in Southeast China. And when we get to that part, I'll explain why that trip was a little bit more stressful. Our guide was James Eaton. He's one of the two owners of the uh, tour group that I've gone with several times, Bird Tour Asia. He lives in Malaysia himself, but he's a Brit. Uh, in Taiwan, I'll just show you, we did a lot of traveling, started in Taipei, went up to Jinshan for a particular rare visitor, then went down the main road on the west coast, up into the mountains, the whole interior of Taiwan is very mountainous, to several national parks uh, for 1,000 meters, uh, 2,400 meters, and uh, so forth, uh, that we then went back to the main road, went to Hubin at a lowland tropical forest. There's still quite a bit of that in some parts of Taiwan. Then up again into the mountains to uh, uh, a home, uh, a privately owned reserve called Firefly Guest House. And then to uh, Alishan Yushuan National Parks down to the coast at Taitung, which is of course, obviously lowland. And then by plane out to Lanyu Island, Orchid Island, back and up again. So a lot of traveling, but over two weeks, it wasn't too bad. Okay, uh, anyway, I went with my friend Patty O'Neill and in September of 2019, we had been discussing a trip to the Southwest Pacific, uh, again with Bird Tour Asia. And uh, she died very suddenly in October of that year. And I still, she had had some, Issue, health issues, but nothing that had, uh, I thought, uh, affected her. And she was one of a really wonderful person, had seen over 7,000 species of birds in the world, and I really miss her quite a bit. Anyway, uh, we arrived at uh, the uh, airport in uh, outside Taipei. This is the famous Taipei 101 tower, it's supposed to look like a bamboo stalk. It's uh, 15 kilometers away from where we are, so it's quite a large building. Bird Tour Asia put us up in a very posh hotel. Um, the Pleasant uh, Hotel International. The first morning, uh, Patty and I and two of the other participants uh, were there uh, before everyone else. So we decided to take a taxi into Taipei and do some sightseeing, which uh, uh, we went to uh, Langshan Temple. It's 
kind of a famous uh, temple in town, but our real goal was to go to the Taipei Botanical Gardens, which is where uh, a number of species might be seen that uh, you know we had been looking for. And so uh, they seem overly concerned with safety in this botanical garden, but nevertheless, we carefully avoided the leaves and we proceeded uh, to look for birds. Uh, in the lotus pond were a number of little egrets. And since this was May, they're in breeding plumage with their plumes. Uh, Chinese bubbles were everywhere. And uh, we saw our first endemic, which is a Taiwanese or Taiwan barbet, uh, a large and very colorful uh, barbet. Okay, so this is our first day. The next day, everyone is there in the hotel. We get on our colorful tour bus, meet our driver, Yu Lin, who was with us the whole trip. Off we go, and the first site we're going to is Jinshan, which if you recall is up in the northeast corner. And the reason we're going there is to see a very rare, very special winter visitor that was there long enough for them to put a sign up. And it's a Siberian crane, which is one of the most endangered birds in the world. But somehow that winter, one of them didn't end up in Poyang Lake in China, but ended up in a fish pond in Northeast Taiwan. So uh, we went up to see it, uh, ticked it up. Most of it, for most of us, it was a, a life bird. You can see it's got a band on it now. Uh, there were some other birds around like Eastern spot bill duck, but mostly we didn't spend a lot of time here having ticked our target. We headed south um, and then up into the mountains. At, a, at about a thousand meters, we stopped at Guguan Hot Springs, which is quite a tourist trap, but it's also a trap for this species, which is the um, uh, Taiwanese varied tit or chestnut belly tit. It's very difficult bird to find in Taiwan, and this particular tourist trap is where it tends to hang out. It must like the hot springs, we assume. Anyway, up we are to this national forest, way up in the mountains, and it's a very beautiful place has a very fancy upscale hotel to stay in. So you're not roughing it while you're up there. And this is a map. And if you take a look at the top, this is about 2,500 meters. And there's a very long winding road. Here's where the hotel is and all the way down to a much lower elevation. And as you can see from here, you don't need to be able to read the Chinese characters to know that pheasants are the big thing at this point. But we started at the very top the first morning. It's almost alpine up there, grass with scattered bushes. And feeding on the ground are two Taiwanese endemics, a Taiwan rosy finch and Alston's bulbul, I mean bullfinch. White whiskered laughing thrush, another Taiwan endemic, as is the Taiwan collared robin, and steers Leo Chikla. All of these are endemics found only on the island of Taiwan. We decided to go having ticked up these birds, we go further down to probably about 2000 meters, which is where the pheasants are. And as you can see, it's a pretty well established site for them. They have a sign, you're supposed to blow your car horn going around the corner in case you might run one of these over. Um, Anyway, what has happened is that maybe 20 years ago, these pheasants were very difficult to find, but uh, bird photography is immensely popular in Asia, including Taiwan. And the uh, photographers have found out if they put down some chicken feed along the roadside, uh, the pheasants will come out and they can get some good pictures. So we planted ourselves at one of the spots where all the chicken feed was, and all we attracted was a Taiwanese spotted nutcracker who was telling us that he did not want peanuts, he wanted cashew nuts. And we also had some ashy wood pigeons, uh, which is an interesting bird because I had seen these in Bhutan and Northern India, uh, but they have a very disjunct distribution. They're missing entirely from Eastern China and then they show up again in Taiwan. So this is probably an endemic subspecies at least of ashy wood pigeon. Anyway, we got a phone call from someone further down the mountain. They said, come quick, we have the pheasants. So we rushed down, here's our group. 
and of course, one of the pheasants. Now, this is a Mikado pheasant. It's one of the most beautiful pheasants in the world. It's a sort of lovely, shiny, navy blue color. Uh, this is, of course, a male. He's displaying to a female by beating his wings. Uh, this is the female with him. And uh, so we watched him for quite a while. And then we go down a little further for the next pheasant target, which is the Swinhose pheasant, also an endemic pheasant in Taiwan. And um, this one was so habituated that when we pulled up the bus, it came running down the road to meet us. Oh, uh, I think that's just a root. You mean this, this uh, thing here? Yeah, that goes right down the midline of the bird all the way to the tail. Yeah, it's an amazing bird. Uh, the hen is a, a beautiful bird in her own right. This is the female. She came out a little later being a bit more shy. Anyway, having put the pheasants to bed, we decided to look for some small birds. And if you've been birding in Asia, you know they often occur in these bird flocks or bird waves. This is a white-eared sibia, also an endemic. black chin tit. A Taiwan barwing. Taiwan Yuhina, Rufus crowned laughing thrush, Taiwan whistling thrush, these are all endemics, except this one. This is a greenback tit. This is a bird found uh, throughout China and Eastern Asia, so uh, it's not an endemic, but it's a pretty bird, so I put the picture in. We left this uh, beautiful park and we went to Elwanda National Forest nearby. We start, uh, started at the Galloping Falls, which is the picture you see here. You go, go out on this little platform, the mist is over you. You have one target, it's little fork tail, which is a, uh, a very cute little tiny bird uh, making its way through the rushing waters. We then uh, went into the park by its, uh, the main part of the park. And you may notice that, again, they're extremely cautious that they don't want anybody uh, harmed. The sign starts out, watch out for poisonous snakes and wasps. Watch out for bears. Caution, slippery path. Caution, stumbling roots. And then down here was another caution that was only in Ch uh, Chinese characters, Mandarin characters. We had no idea what it was, but naturally being birds, we immediately rushed down this path as quickly as we could, hoping we might see a bear, but we did not. We did, however, see a Taiwan blue magpie, a rusty laughing thrush, a gray-cheeked fulvetta, Taiwan vivid miltava, which is a flycatcher, and then this really amazing lizard. It has got a name almost as long as its tail, which is four times the length of the body. It is a Formosan long-tailed green grass lizard. So there. <laughs> we also uh, had this uh, amazing thing. I've never seen it before, but I heard about it. These are two male Chinese rat snakes fighting over a female. And it's pretty hard to wrestle when you don't have arms and legs, but they were doing a good job of twisting around each other. One would push the other down, they would come back. And we watched them for about 15 minutes with no apparent winner, so we got bored and walked away. <laughs> so finally, we left the, head, uh, the highlands and headed back to the west coast to the town of Hubin. Now, Hooban is where everyone in the world goes to see fairy pittas because they actually breed here and there's quite a recovery program. Fairy pitta is a species whose population is in total free fall. They're declining at an amazingly rapid rate. There's two reasons for that. One, most of their breeding areas in China have been developed. And secondly, they have the very unfortunate habit of wintering in Borneo, which is rapidly being changed into 100% oil palm plantations. But nevertheless, they do persist breeding in Taiwan in these lowland bamboo dominated wet forests. So we headed off into the lowland bamboo dominated wet forest, which is also dominated by some terrible tiny stinging fly, which we all got totally bitten up by. 
and managed to find two fairy pittas, males, singing in branches high in the tree, uh, and one of the most beautiful birds. The pittas, of course, are uh, the jewel birds. There's even a book called Jewel Hunter about a person that tried to see all the pittas in the world in, in one year, which he accomplished, and that was before they split uh, a couple of the species into about 10 other species, so he has to start over again, but we won't talk about that. Another bird uh, found in the same habitat is the Taiwanese red oriole. And Taiwanese or Taiwan scimitar babbler. We left there and headed back into the hills. Uh, this is a Firefly's guest house. It's a privately run homestay. The man who runs it is a conservationist and he owns all this property in the back. And he's put up blinds where you can sit and look for some of the rarer birds. Uh, they put out bait, and one of the birds that we were looking for was the uh, Taiwan wood partridge, and a bird almost impossible to see except under these sorts of circumstances. And we did manage, as you see, to see two of them. He took us out later that evening, or actually at night. <clears throat> Turns out he's a wonderful conservationist, but not very good with the spotlight because he managed to scare off the mountain scops owl, but we did get the collared scops owl. And uh, we also saw, this is not a good picture, but it's the only one I got. Uh, the flying squirrels in Taiwan are about the size of large cats. Oh, This is a white and red, red and white flying squirrel. And there's also another species which, um, giant red flying squirrel, which we didn't see. Wow. Leaving there, we still in the mountains, we went to Alishan and Yushuan parks. They're adjacent to one another and you sort of start in one and end up in the other. So we will try to separate them. Uh, starting at the Takata Visitor Center, which is a bamboo area, we're looking for specific bamboo specialists like golden parrot bill, and this is the Taiwan subspecies. Uh, the one in China is much more gold. I have seen the one in China. Uh, and their own endemic uh, kinglet, the flame crest. Uh, Taiwan fulvetta, another small uh, flock following bird. And a Taiwan cupwing. They used to call these pygmy babblers, but then they realized genetically they're not related to babblers. And so this is one of the uh, cup wings. And it's a tiny bird, very uh, a skulking, sort of like a winter wren type of behavior. And we actually saw this one carrying food. So she was uh, feeding a, some chicks in the nest. Another bird found in the general area in bamboo is the Taiwan bush warbler or Taiwan grasshopper warbler, sometimes called. It's a locustella warbler. Going around the hotel in the evening, we managed to catch up with a uh, one individual of the Taiwan race of the Chinese tawny owl. Now, whether this will be split or not, I don't know, but it's endemic to the mountains of Taiwan. It's uh, about the size of a barred owl, very similar. So now we leave the mountains. We're heading down, at a, uh, down to the coast on the uh, southeast side of the island. We go to Tatung Forest Park for a few birds. Uh, uh, Stryan's bubble, uh, which is only found in this area, and also the Taiwan Huamai. Now the Huamais, if you've birded in Asia, uh, the, uh, they're a very common ca cage bird in Asia. Uh, the, uh, you'll see uh, pictures of them. They have a beautiful song and they're not really native to Taiwan. However, they have been inadvertently or possibly deliberately re released into Taiwan. And so their populations expanded and is swamping the endemic uh, Huamai so that this is one of the only areas where you can find this particular species. Anyway, having ticked this one up, we're off to Lanyu Island or Orchid Island, which is out in the Philippine Sea, a beautiful tropical island. You can spend a whole vacation there, even if there weren't any birds. There's beautiful reefs and stuff like that. So we get on this little plane. 
There we are, all ready to go. We actually saw some beaked whales from the plane, but we weren't able to identify which species they were. We land, uh, this is looking at our hotel, looking at the beautiful beach. However, we spent no time on the beautiful beach. We immediately went to the swampy wet gully uh -huh. inland from the beautiful beach looking for uh, certain birds. Now these birds that we're looking for are not endemic really to Taiwan. There are species that are found on this island and they're also found on the islands of Japan like Rikuku. Uh, anyway, um, here we are and uh, there was another birding group so there'll be people in there that aren't with us. A whistling green pigeon uh, found here and also in the islands, tropical islands of Japan. Elegant scopsowl. This may actually be split because it is an endemic uh, subspecies. Japanese paradise flycatcher. This is a male. The females have much shorter tails, and we found a nest even of those. The nests are minute, little tiny cups, and the male sits there with his tail hanging out, and uh, it's quite picturesque. Uh, uh, Unexpected bonus was a northern boobook, which is the northern hawk owl. It's an owl, but you can see it has a very hawkish appearance to it. The last morning before we flew back, we did a little tiny bit of sea watching, and we did see a few seabirds like uh, wedgetail shearwater, which is the pretty funny to have seabirds on an inland birding trip, but there you are. So we come back to the mainland, we go up the East Coast, we stay overnight in some hotel somewhere, and then we go over Taroko Gorge, which is one of the most scenic areas of Taiwan. It's famous for its cloud formations. I must have 20 pictures of cloud formations. I'll only bore you with that one and this one, but it is beautiful. We stopped at the top of the gorge uh, doing some birding, and we picked up a few birds like uh, silverback needle tail swifts going overhead. And one of our birds we had been looking for rather desperately uh, was the Taiwan yellow tit. We'd only seen sort of crappy little views of it. And uh, obviously it's an endemic. And this one was sitting up, his little crest being blown around by the wind and we had a good chance to admire him. Uh, we stayed in a guest house our last uh, night of birding. Uh, they fed us very well, and uh, we had a very good night. And then the next morning, we did the Blue Gate Trail. This is the last woodland birding we did. Uh, caught up with some species like a rufous face warbler, which is not an endemic. It's found throughout Asia. And a white-tailed robin, again, oh, found my. throughout Asia. But we're happy to finally get some good views of them. Anyway, we head back to uh, Taipei. Uh, we have our last night at the same hotel. And then we're off to China. So we'll go our little bit of China. Now, the Chinese goals, the goals for the trip to China were entirely different. Uh, we're going to try and see three critically endangered species, the Chinese crested tern, which has a world population of about 50, blue crowned laughing thrush, which has a world population of about 200, and spoonbill sandpiper, which has a world population of about 600 to 700. Now that one is increasing, but all the others are declining. Also to connect with some pheasants, uh, since we've been doing some pheasanting, uh, Cabot's tragopan, Elliot's pheasant, Ricketts partridge, and some range restricted species such as reed and short-tailed parrotbill, pied falconet. The downside of this trip was that it meant visiting some very widely separated areas. Um, you start here, we flew into Fuzhou, go to M.A. Fang, Wuyuan, and then all the way up to Shanghai. These are about eight hour drives. This was a 10 hour drive. So there was a hell of a lot of long drives on this trip. And I think this was actually the first year they did it and the last year they did it, they really realized there was too much driving and uh, now the uh, itinerary has been uh, greatly uh, extended, more days on the ground and more, more places visited. But nevertheless, we were there, we're gonna go do some birding. The first place we go to is Minyang Estuary and uh, it's the place for Chinese crested tern. Now this was a species thought to be extinct 
And it was rediscovered about 20 years ago, just a few individuals, and they've since uh, determined that I think there's a small colony offshore of South Korea now. Um, anyway, what you do is you, your car, your bus is parked here. You take a little boat or a punt out to here and they drop you on the beach. And if you're lucky on a rising tide, the turns will come in with greater crested turns and roost on the sandbars. This isn't us, this is something I got off the internet, but it shows the, the kind of little punt you're in. These are Chinese crested terns. Uh, they're not, that is not my picture. I will explain why it's not my picture because we didn't get anywhere as close as these birds were, but this shows you um, a little bit about them. They have a black tip bill, they're very pale mantle and considerably smaller than greater crested terns. This is uh, them in flight. And when we got out there to the beach with the rising tide, we found that there was a passel of Chinese bird photographers already there standing on the sandbar that the birds were supposed to be landing on. So naturally the birds did not come in. They only flew around. They start to come in and then they'd fly off and then they start to come in, fly off. And the look that we had of these birds was more like that. <laughs> you know, we could see this very pale, small turn, smaller turn flying with the darker, larger turns. And that's the only look we had. So you have to decide, well, are you going to tick that one or not? I guess after a lot of consideration, I decided I would since I'm never going to see it again. But I wasn't very pleased. Anyway, uh, later that day, we went to Fu's show. National Forest Park, just to see some sort of regular forest birds like uh, this chestnut bubble, fort sunbird. But this was our actual target. This is Ricketts partridge, which we managed to get very good looks at one individual. And that was what we came for. So we turned around and left. Um, we then had an eight hour drive to Emmy Feng National Nature Reserve. I have this picture that I stole from the internet because I forgot to take a picture of the hotel at the very top of the mountain. Um, you stay in these sort of cabin-like areas. Uh, it's perfectly comfortable and the food is good. The major problem with this is 50% of the time it's foggy. So the first uh, day we were there, it was foggy all day. This is a Chinese bamboo partridge in the fog. Um, yeah, not very good, eh? And then uh, the next morning was beautiful. So this is the view from the top, as you can see. And we managed to have Chinese bamboo partridges right outside our door. So there you are. Once in a while, you get lucky. So you walk down through a beautiful forest of cryptomeria. Now, cryptomeria is a commonly grown ornamental around here, but down in uh, this part of Thai, uh, China, they are a native species of evergreen tree. And you walk down about four or five kilometers and the bus comes down behind you and picks you up. On the way down, you see things like gray-sided scimitar babbler, um, mustache laughing thrush, uh, possibly some butterflies, uh, this beautiful snake that I've never been able to identify. Um, it's probably highly venomous, so we didn't pick it up and admire it, but it has a cobra-ish look, but I don't think it is one. Anyway, we go all the way to the bottom where I have uh, villages that have a number of uh, fish ponds and uh, rice ponds. Uh, we saw quite a few mandarin ducks, which is uh, a difficult species to run into, but uh, they're out in the ponds, but extremely wary. So we got out of our bus to try to get better looks. This is rather a bad picture because it's taken from quite a distance and they immediately fly off. Uh, Things like white wagtails also out there. Our main target down there was Elliot's pheasant. And we did manage to see one from the bus. Um, uh, they're extremely shy. And if you try to get out and get anywhere near it, it takes off into the forest. They're not uh, baited and photographed the way the ones in Taiwan are. Going up in the bus uh, several times, we ran into Cabot's tragopans. This is a hen with a chick. 
We did manage to see males in the forest. Uh, I don't have any pictures of them in the forest. The best picture I have from the bus is this, which is pretty damn bad. So I stole a picture from the internet so you can see what they actually look like. And we did see one, uh, one or two like this, but they were up in a tree feeding. Uh, lots of silver pheasants. I think we saw over 20 silver pheasants in the time we were there. We then left another eight hour drive to Wuyuan City. Um, uh, James Eaton said that when he first went there, uh, it was a village in the last 10 or 15 years, it's grown into a city. It's where you go, it's one of the places you go if in the winter you go to China to go to Poyang Lake for cranes and for the Lian River for scaly sided merganser. But of course we were there in the spring, uh, so we weren't doing that. We went first to Kenkau Village where the river runs through. It's a very picturesque village. Uh, what's happening here? Oh, nothing. A lot of people come to this area of China, Chinese tourists, to go to these villages because they're extremely uh, picturesque with covered bridges, old gardens, uh, old homes, and uh, apparently uh, uh, regional foods that are quite popular. But we don't, didn't care about those. We came for birds. Um, okay, Shimen Village is the place where an extremely, one of our rare targets is the blue crowned laughing thrush. Now they breed in colonies, which most laughing thrushes do not, in islands in this river. And the local, uh, locals have made quite a thing out of this because all the birders come here. Uh, the local children uh, have painted all these uh, abutments of a local bridge with the bird. But when we were there, we had a little bit of an issue. They had had so much trouble, it's not advancing. They had had so much trouble with badly behaved photographers. They were not allowing photographers out on the islands where these birds breed. So we had to put all our cameras away and Okay, we had to put our cameras away. Uh, you paid a little guy a, a few bits and pieces to watch your cameras and you walked out on this causeway and uh, observed the birds. So two years later, when they ran the Taiwan trip again, they weren't doing this anymore. So I actually stole pictures from the 2018 trip. Uh, so you can see what the birds look like. That is, if okay, I'll just go back a bit. The next and last village, uh, Zhao Qi village. Um, it's famous for its cuisine, which we hadn't realized. And almost every house along that street is a restaurant. So what the restaurants have learned is that bird photographers like to take pictures of unusual birds. And one of the unusual birds that's found around this village is the pied falconet. Now that's a species with a rather wide range. I've seen it in Vietnam, I think or maybe Malaysia, there's a lot of falconets, but what you do is you go to the restaurant and you have a nice meal, which, <laughs> can you advance it by hand? Okay. Okay, well, you have a nice meal. I mean, we haven't had our meal yet, but it's going to be served to us. And once you've eaten your meal, you go up on the roof where they've set up a blind and you sit there and you look down to your right and down to your left and every rooftop has photographers out there with their big lenses. So we join them with our big lenses or small lenses, whatever we have. 
And we have the pied falconet coming in with a spotted dove on the left. As you can figure out, the spotted dove is about the size of a collared dove. So you can see how tiny the falconet is. If you go on to the next slide, uh, that's a close-up uh, picture of the falconet. It's a, a, a minute falcon, uh, very cute. However, now we are leaving. So we're going to go on for our 10 hour, 10 and a half hour drive up to Shanghai. And most of the trip, the roads are entirely empty. That is the thing that impressed us. You see almost no other vehicles. Tremendously wonderful advanced infrastructure, almost no use of said infrastructure, at least at the moment. Okay. We did do a couple of stops. It's a typical uh, rest stop. We were the only people in it. Go on. Okay. Pick up some nice uh, snacks, numb and spicy, hot pot. They don't sell this in the US. <laughs> okay, okay uh, next slide. <laughs> You know you're getting close to Shanghai when you uh, see Xuchao uh, City with its uh, distinctive architecture. And our next stop is Yangkou, uh, where we're put into a little hotel right across from all the fishing boats in the lower Yangtze River are tied up uh, and uh, very picturesque because the next morning we're going out to look for Spoonbill Sandpiper. So uh, the Yangtze Estuary uh, it's a huge estuarine complex at low tide. It's one of the major stopover areas for shorebirds in uh, the east coast of China. And uh, we had, for example, in that one day, an estimated 3,000 redneck stints. And unfortunately, redneck stints in breeding plumage and spoonbill sandpipers in breeding plumage are almost exactly the same color. So. Uh, unless you can see the bill. So we spent a lot of time running up and down. Um, we had a, a nice Saunders gulls flying overhead, a uh, very picturesque gull, uh, about the size of a Bonaparte skull. Uh, quite a few shorebirds. There's red knot, great knot, lesser sand plover, and so forth. Okay. Huh? Yeah, great tailed tattler. Anyway, this is a redneck stint, and the spoonbill sandpiper is a bit bulkier than this, and of course has the spoonbill, but otherwise. So <clears throat> the, the idea that we had, well, this is one of those ideas that doesn't work out. High tide was supposed to be at 9.30 in the morning. We were out there around seven o'clock. Our theory was that the tide would come in and push the birds, of course, up towards the shore so they'd be concentrated and we would be able to better go through them. Uh, the, uh, there were several fallacies with that. One of them was the tide tables were wrong or we read them wrong or the offshore wind screwed us up. But by 930, the tide was still way the hell out. If you want to... Uh, that's <laughs> so um, nevertheless, uh, we persevered for several hours. I think we were out there about five hours slogging through the mud. I must have seen 3000 redneck stints, but I saw no spoonbill sandpiper. The only good thing about it was for everybody on the trip, spoonbill sandpiper was not a life bird. Every one of us had at one time or the other seen it in Hong Kong or, so, or in Thailand, but we hadn't never seen it in breeding plumage, so it would have been nice, but we didn't see it. Next one. So that's the one that got away. That's the Spoonbill Sandpiper. The 2018 tour saw it, of course. I mean, what can you say? They probably had an onshore wind. Anyway, we did have one last site. It's a Changming Island, which is an island in the Yangtze estuary. It used to be a nature reserve and very wild, but it's being built up with uh, Chinese McMansions. I'm not sure if they're Chinese McMansions, but the whole place is being covered with these really nice looking homes, 
uh, but unfortunately they're being put where all the reed beds were. But we did find eventually a few reed beds that hadn't been cut down. And we got our last target, which is reed parrot bill, which is quite a huge, big parrot bill. And uh, that was at the end of the day, of our very last day. And we were quite happy that we finally saw a bird that we were looking for, as opposed to spending hours not finding a bird we were looking for. And so thus endeth the trip. And that's it. We go to the Shanghai airport and we fly home. Well, that was very impressive. Thank you very much, Gail. And, and you know, when Any I- Any questions? Can you hear me? Yeah, it was a wonderful trip. I would say one thing though, if you ever do Eastern China, don't go on a trip where you're only there for six days and you have eight and 10 hour drives in between sites. Go for two weeks and go to more places. I'll try to avoid that. Yeah. So, so any more questions? And I'll probably spend the next three weeks putting this uh, um, presentation together, cutting out all the, <laughs> the stops and starts. Sorry. Sorry about that. That's okay. You always have a few issues. The 33 endemics. We saw all, yeah, I should tell you that. We saw, I wrote this down at the end. I thought people might ask. Okay, okay. in Taiwan, we saw all 33 endemics and we saw 166 species in total. Uh, in China, we saw 194 species, most of which are pretty widespread. And uh, of those four were heard only, they were owls and things like that. Um, uh, China is really good birding. I went the next year to Sichuan, which we saw even more pheasants and um, pandas. We didn't see wild pandas, but uh, you can see wild pandas. The Bird Tour Asia trip, uh, a couple of years before the COVID lockdown, they had a wild panda while they were in one of the areas we were in, but we didn't see a wild panda. Only pandas in the introduced, they have these big, huge uh, pens, like multi-acre pens where they're trying to rehabilitate or not rehabilitate, reintroduce pandas bred in captivity into the wild in Sichuan. And we did go to a couple of those places, but no actual wild pandas. But China's, uh, as several people have said, right now, uh, I think you said, Clive, they're not running any trips because of the concerns that you might get caught in one of these zero COVID lockdowns. But they don't have zero COVID lockdowns in Taiwan, so you're welcome to go there anytime. And you can do it on your own. So it's Barry's brother and family did it on their own. They were really the impetus that I wanted to go, actually. No other questions? Yes, uh, now, for example, Bird Tour Asia, they only do Asia, but for them, Asia includes Indonesia, and, you know, uh, they even run a trip, they even ran a trip last year to Saudi Arabia. I mean, yeah. not sure as a woman I would go there, but they did see some good birds. But primarily, they're Asian, but uh, rock jumper, uh, field guides, uh, tropical birding, despite its name, it isn't only tropical bird and uh, bird quest and so forth lead tours. Um, depends on where you're going. I mean, we've been to Bhutan twice and I would never go with the tour group because they have in-country tour groups that are bird experts that are just as good and much less expensive. So, you know, you just have to know what you're doing. <clears throat> And I just oh, wonderful there. pictures of the birds. I think it was just beautiful. Yeah, the, uh, the first day uh, was May the 1st, but that was the day that we went in on our own to Taipei. And the last day was May 19th. And that was the day where we saw the, or failed to see the uh, spoonbill sandpiper. So it was 19 days, well, really 18 days, uh, with a lot of long drives in China and not that many long drives in Taiwan. I think we had one day, it was about six hours and that was about it. Okay.
Oh, it's a mandarin rat snake. Okay. Okay. Oh, Beautiful it's all snake. one fighting a weasel once. Hmm. Well, it's a bit better than my first visit to Thai, Thailand when I walked down to the river and the first thing I saw was a spinning cobra on the rock. <laughs> I decided to back off. Okay. I guess that's it. Thank you again, Gail. That was that was wonderful. So, I guess that's it. We will be getting together again in December. What's Emily? Do you remember the date? Uh, December fourteenth. December fourteenth for our. Right. Yeah. Wednesday, oh, December fourteenth. That's right. Yeah, at the church.